Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. In one of the Psalms, Dawood, David, says, I am prayer. It's a profound statement. What he is saying, among other things, is that I am in a constant state of need from my Lord. I am in a constant state of being obligated to my Lord. So I am in a constant state of prayer to my Lord because for every thing that I do, I do through his will. For everything that I'm involved with, I'm involved with through his will. Everything is from him and of him. Now, when we pray, we somehow begin to classify what it is that we think we need. And we ask God in our own way to provide various things for us. But we are lost to the understanding that everything at all times is provided by Allah. Everything at all times is given to us by God. Everything comes from him. And so when we begin to differentiate as to specific things that we think we need or we think we want, what we are doing, or one of the things that we're doing, is we're reacting to specific desire and we're being driven by desire. So can we get to the point where we are driven by the understanding that everything comes from him and that he supplies for us what we need according to what we're capable of receiving. There was a dervish who heard that there was a name of God. And if you used this name of God, you could get whatever you wanted in the world. And he went to his sheikh and he said that I've heard that there's a name of God, that if you learn this name of God and you repeat this name of God, you can do anything you want in this world. And the sheikh said, well, there's truth to that. And I know someone who knows that name. His name is Hassan. And he lives in a village, a small city, a certain amount of distance from here. And if you go here, if you go there and you ask him, you can find out about it. And the man, the dervish went and he got to the place, to the town where Hassan lived. And he asked around as to Hassan, who was Hassan. Finally, he found him and he spoke to him a little bit and Hassan was pulling a carriage. And they were about to enter the gates of the city and Hassan's carriage bumped into one of the guards that was guarding the entrance to the city. And the guard was outraged and he began to beat Hassan. And Hassan began to apologize profusely and ask for forgiveness and, 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 and told him that he didn't mean it, it was an accident. And after a while, the guards stopped beating him and let him go. 
and they went into the city. And the dervish said, you know, since you know the name of God that can be used to do anything you want, you could have used that and destroyed him. As a matter of fact, you could have destroyed the entire city. And he said to the dervish, he said, that's why I know the name of God and you don't, because I don't think like you do. And if I thought like you do, that name would never have been given to me. So we have to understand that we become open to things as we are ready to be open to things. We become open to that which is Allah's grace as we become worthy of those stations. So to truly know how to pray, we have to truly begin to integrate ourselves with Allah's qualities. And we have to learn how to act with Allah's qualities. So we have to know the names of the qualities. We have to know what those qualities entail. Then we have to be able to incorporate them into our being and then we have to be able to act with them. As all of that occurs, we learn what it is that we need to do to commune with Allah. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is to release ourselves from self motive, release ourselves from desire. Now, imagine praying without specific desire. Imagine praying without concentrating on some elemental thing that you wish could be brought into either your possession or your control. Imagine praying in that way. There was a uh, man who was wandering through the mountains and uh, he ran across a little hut, he was hungry and there was a woman outside, an older woman who was gardening and she saw him and she immediately said to him, uh, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? And he indicated that he was. And she told him to come in and she gave him something to eat. And she gave him something to drink. And she told him about life. She told him about God. She told him about the grace that Allah brings into this world and how that grace is available to him. And she also had a little basket there with a lot of stones in it. And he saw one stone in particular and uh, she saw him looking at it. And she said, would you like that? And he said, yes. And she gave him the stone and he left and he went into town and he thought, you know, I'm looking at this, this might be valuable. And he went to a jeweler, showed the jeweler the stone. And he said, this is a very large amethyst and it has great value. And he told him how much he would give him for it. And the man had second thoughts. He said, she must have not known what this is worth. And it's wrong for me to just take it from her and make it into my own gain. So he decided to go back to her and to give it to her. And after a, a long journey, he got there again and she was outside again and he showed her the stone and he said, this is 
worth a lot of money. And I didn't think it was right for me to take it from you. So I'm returning it to you. And she said, I knew it was worth a lot of money. I knew its value and I wanted to give it to you. And he said, no, I want to give it back. And she said, okay, but is there anything I can do for you? And he said, yes. Can you teach me or give me some of that wisdom and that grace and that kindness and that generosity that you have, which is worth more than any material thing? And she said, we'll try, but you have to grow that within yourself. And this is the lesson that we have to learn, that there are things in this world that are more valuable than material things. And until we allow ourselves to open up to those things, until we feel the power of those qualities, we can't know their wealth. So until compassion runs through our being, we can't know the value of compassion. Until mercy runs through our being, we can't know the value of mercy. Until justice runs through our being, we can't know the value of justice. But once we get a taste of compassion or mercy or justice, once we get a taste of kindness, of love, of unconditional love, we begin to understand what that can do for us. All people are looking for love. All people are looking for kindness. All people are looking to be accepted. Yet, all people also create separations between themselves and other people. This world is full of separations. This world is full of people holding certain people close to them and pushing other people away from them. This world is full of different people forming different clubs and these clubs being separated from each other and being afraid of each other. And that fear stops love. There were a group of people living on one side of a valley and nobody was at the other side of a valley of the valley until a group migrated to that side of the valley and the people who had been there didn't know who they were and didn't know anything about them so they began to be worried they said that they come here to attack us did they come here to get what we wanted? So they began to gather stones to defend themselves. And they began to pile up stones and pile these stones higher and higher. And the people who moved there on the other side of the valley had no ill intent. But then when they saw these stones piling up, they thought, my God, they have ill intent or they wouldn't be piling these stones up. So they began to pile stones up. Pretty soon, both sides had created huge walls of stones between them. So there were no longer people on the other side of the valley. There were just enemies. And they created that kind of separation and animosity. As we develop, our godly nature, we begin to understand that we have 
no enemies in the world, that we have no separation from anybody else in the world, and that the world is elemental and that we are elemental to a degree, but we are also more than that. There is a part of us, a small part of us, that is non-form, that is non-elemental in the way that Allah is that unique entity, <clears throat> that unique element that is without form. And when we begin to understand that, then our connection to God and our connection to prayer is not as involved with form. It becomes involved with formlessness. It becomes involved with that which is godly as opposed to that which is worldly. The Sheikh is the great teacher for this transformation from the worldly to the godly. He's the great teacher of this path that crosses the ocean of illusion or the chasm of illusion and brings you to reality. So our idea of prayer has to do with our relationship to reality. As we are more based in Hak, our prayer becomes the prayer of Hakikat. As we are more based in the world, our prayer is more worldly. Our prayer is more elemental. Our prayer deals with elemental things. When we are with a wise being, when we are with one who is spending his life in Hakikat, as opposed to the elemental world, that resonance of Hakikat enters and infiltrates us. That non-elemental reality resonates and becomes part of us. And that which was brought about by desire in us within the elemental world fades because the resonance of truth sets fire to the elemental needs and desire. It wipes them away. The resonance of truth clears us of that. Now, we need to understand that there is a cleansing process that goes on. And this cleansing process only happens if we intend this cleansing process to occur. The act of intending this cleansing process is a high state. It means that we have determined for our own life to go beyond what we see, touch, feel, hear, smell, and sense. That we've come to the conclusion that there's more to existence than what we touch and see or than what we desire. And all of a sudden, we have entered into another phase of being where we now understand what's important in 
hoc in reality. We understand the, the, the arc of our existence and we're not stuck at the specific place in our existence where we are right now. We understand that existence is more than this particular state that we're in at this moment and this particular life that we lead right now. There's more to our existence than that. We are in a phase. Uh, if we take this phase and begin to believe that all we are is this phase, then we become stuck in this phase and it becomes binding on us and holds us in place. We need to allow ourselves to go from this phase into the other phases of our existence, to begin to understand where we came from, why we were put here, as opposed to just playing with the elemental forms in front of us, which is what babies do. You put toys in front of babies and they play. They throw things up and down. They play with elemental forms. We have to stop playing with elemental forms and start giving consideration and thought to non-elemental forms. Consideration and thought to our Lord and what his intention was for us. And then we have to begin to align our intention with his intention. Now, the world is full of magnetisms. We are elemental. So we are drawn by our very elemental nature to elemental things within the world. There is this elemental connection. And sometimes this elemental connection is so strong that we think there is a real need and it's called lust in the same way that there's an elemental connection between man and women there's an elemental connection between ourselves and things in the world and we begin to think that we love these things. We love cars, we love homes, we love watches, we love all kinds of different elemental things. And we begin to believe that in order for us to be satisfied, we have to acquire these elemental things, or somehow we are missing something. Well, this is what's called attachment. And we have all of these attachments to worldly things. And somehow we have to break these attachments and be able to be satisfied understanding the nature of Allah in our existence and what it is that he gives us and what it is that he gives us every moment. And to break these attachments, again, begins with an, 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 an intention, understanding how these attachments exist and what these attachments do to us and how they make our mind believe that they're necessary for our existence. Books have been written about these kinds of things. When I was in college, I read a book called The Theory of Conspicuous Consumption. And it was about how we very often think we need things, not because they have some utilitarian value for us, but because 
by having them, it makes us bigger and makes us more and makes us more noticeable. So we buy things not because we need them, but we buy things because what other people will think of us and thus the title conspicuous consumption. The point being that our relationship with the elemental world is very complicated. And we need to understand how complicated it is and we need to be able to do something about ending it. Now, there's a great fear in that. And the fear is that if we somehow end our relationship with all of these elemental things that has, have given us what we think is so much pleasure and so much satisfaction over our life, we will be left with nothing. We will be left without <clears throat> anything in our life. And we're afraid of that. We're afraid of giving up what we have. But in reality, when you're able to give these things up, Allah will replace them by introducing his qualities into your life just like the story of the man who wanted to know the secret name of God and was told that until you think right, you can't know that. In the same way, until we think right, until we become appropriate, we can't understand God's qualities and know God's qualities because of our desire creating a separation between the non-form and the form, and being concentrated on that which is form. Now, this takes an enormous amount of work. This takes an enormous amount of intent. But when the intent comes from within us to do this, the wisdom that goes with that intent will rise within us. We already have the wisdom within us to understand the true nature of form, non-form, of form and hak, of form and hakikat, of form and reality. We have to come to a conclusion that we're more interested in knowing truth than we are in the idols of the world. We have to come to the conclusion that the idols of the world, money, fame, power, are less important to us than our eternal life. And we have to give our eternal life consideration. And we have to understand that eternal life is in a formless state. And if we are attached to form, the transition to a formless state is incredibly difficult. And that's the reason for rebirth. Because we're so attached to the form, we keep coming back to the form. Only when we release ourselves from form, can we move on into the formless state of Allah and Allah's qualities? So we have to decide what we have to, what we want to hold on to. We have to decide what it is that we really need in our life. And then we, what happens is when we decide what we really need, what we really want, that's what directs our prayers. That's what directs our intention. So through developing the wisdom that understands the superiority of knowing Allah to knowing the world, then we will enter into a phase 
where we change. We will enter into a phase where we become different and where our attitudes towards things becomes different. If we don't get it, and if we have trouble grasping it, and if we're still attached to the world, and all of us are attached to the world, then we have to pray for the release of these attachments. We have to pray to understand the difference. And we have to know that we are on a path that while we are in this world has no end. We don't come to a conclusion here. We don't come to a place where we say, okay, I've made it. We have to stay in a place where we, where we are very, very small. When an elephant walks through the jungle, there's nowhere where he can hide because of his immense size. And a hunter with two well-placed shots can easily kill the elephant. But an ant has no trouble hiding. An ant who's small has millions of crevices that it can go into and disappear and hide itself from all of the influences, all of the magnetisms of the world. So as we become small, as we become humble, as we begin to understand in our smallness, we are able to enter more easily into formlessness, we begin to grow in wisdom. Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, what's that mean? It means you have to be very small to go through the eye of a needle. And we have to become very small. Now, you can be a rich man and still be very small. There was a man who was a stranger in town. And he walked up to a house. It was a big house, obviously a rich man's house and knocked on the door. All of a sudden he saw all the shades close in the house and he saw the lights go out and nobody answered the door. So he saw a stranger in the street and he said, I'm from out of town, I'm hungry, I have nothing to eat. Is there anyone that you can suggest that might help me? And he said, well, you went to the wrong place. Uh, that rich man doesn't ever give anybody anything but there's a shoemaker down the street and he's known to be very generous. Why don't you go knock on his door? So he went to the shoemaker who lived in a humble house and he invited him in and he ate with him and he slept on the floor in front of the fireplace that night. And when he uh, awoke, the shoemaker gave him two silver coins to continue on his journey. Time went on and the rich man died. After the rich man died, people were sent to the shoemaker's house in the same way as they were before for assistance. And then the shoemaker told this story, which eventually got around to the entire town. He said, I barely make enough money for food for my wife and family. The reason I've been able to be generous is that the rich man that lived in the big house was always asking me what people needed and he always gave me the money to hand out to other people. And he didn't want to be known, so he did that through me. Now that he's gone, that stream of generosity is gone 
and I no longer can do what I used to do. And from that time on, people started leaving flowers on the rich man's grave. So there are lots of ways that we can be involved in hockey cut. There are lots of ways that we can be involved in doing God's work. We need to find a way that is suitable for us to do that. And we need to find a way to release ourselves from desire and attachment to this elemental world and find our way into the formless qualities of our creator and to understand love and kindness and generosity and compassion and mercy and make that what it is that we ask for make that what it is that we pray for and then when that happens generosity is praying to generosity compassion is praying to compassion mercy is praying to mercy and there's a joinder of those things may we all understand that may we all become that may we all find that path towards reality amin amin ya rabbil alamin assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh